Hi, I'm Lucas Walker and I'm a results leader. You're listening to resultsleader.fm. Being a thought leader is easy. Getting results is hard. This show is for the results leader who lives and dies by their results. Here is your host and chief results leader, Jonathan Rivera. This is the only show on the internet dedicated to results. Welcome back to another episode of ResultsLeader.fm. So glad you guys are here. And you know what we do. We are peeling back the curtain on the men and women who are getting results for their clients. Today, Mr. Lucas Walker is joining us and he helps deconstruct tired ideas and apply them in new ways to help scale your business. Let's jump in. Lucas, welcome to the show. Are you ready to rock this thing? I am so ready, Jonathan. Thank you. Well, let's do it, man. Let's give our listeners a quick win. What book have you given most as a gift? Yeah, so on this one, I might be different than a lot of your guests. I really believe in books as a prescription. So I don't have one book. I really identify what their problem is. And then there's usually a book that can maybe help. And that to me is a big difference between what you're talking about here as results leadership versus thought leadership of What is the problem they're having? And then what will help them get that result? Some owners maybe work too hard and they need to figure out how to relax more. Some need to find out how to work harder or more organized. So it really, really depends. So kind of an out of the box, not exactly what you're looking for answer there. But I find a lot of entrepreneurs dive too deep into reading lots of books that don't actually affect what they need to do. It gets in the way of their results. All right. So I need to relax more. What book are you recommending? Uh, you need to relax more. I would say if you need to relax more and also find more peace and like enjoyment in life, The Artist's Way is a really good book. It's actually meant for blocked creative people that maybe can't write the play they want to write, but it's wonderful for entrepreneurs. Some of the thoughts in it are kind of meditations. They're like free form writing meditations and also a wonderful thing called The Artist's Date, which is basically a date with yourself where you go out and do something fun to fill your well back up so you have energy to enjoy life. I'll take the prescription. (laughs) Wonderful. (laughs) All right. Let's talk about failure. Tell us a story of how an apparent failure set you up for later success. Yeah. So for me, it was actually leaving my jobby job. So I always didn't know about entrepreneurship. I started off thinking, hey, you just go get a job that's safe. You grind that away for your years until retirement. Um, And I had a job that wanted to lower the commission structure across the board I'd been there for seven years, giving them my heart, soul, blood, sweat, and tears. And I realized this isn't so safe. For me, that was kind of a crisis of, well, what do you do now? Do you put your faith in someone else that's also maybe doesn't care about you besides being a cog in their machine? Or do you go out on your own? And I didn't know how to go out on my own. I didn't really know what that looked like. And that started my entire journey of me trying to figure out how do you not be a kind of a slave within that machine to the whiplash of whatever uh, someone higher up wants to do and take that own fate on yourself. And that started my whole journey, which now is what I coach all of my clients on is how do they take the skill of what they're good at and build the business pieces around that to find their success. So if I hadn't had that job that uh, wanted to lower my, my pay structure in an unsustainable way to wake me up to the fact they didn't care about me as much as I cared about them, I wouldn't have realized that it's actually much safer to be my own boss. Man, some people argue that a job is security and you're saying it's the opposite. Is that right? It's totally the opposite. If you're a hard worker, I mean, a lot of my clients, I find that they're actually the best employee ever until they're the worst. They're unhirable, meaning that they treat the business like it's their own and they're just, you know, a mid-level, lower level person. And then whenever they leave all that energy, they were pushing someone else's rock uphill with all that resistance. Other person scooping all the cream off the top. What would you say is the most worthwhile investment you've ever made? Yeah. So the most worthwhile investment I ever made was starting training Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Do you know what that is by chance? I have so many friends that tell me about this and I want to hear (laughs) your reason for that being your thing. Yeah. So it's kind of like wrestling, like it would be in college or in the Olympics, not like fake WWF wrestling. And the goal is is it's you versus another person. And it's a puzzle that you solve physically where you're trying to essentially Uh, strangle that person or put them in a joint lock where they have to admit that you won and say uncle more or less. The amazing part about learning Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for me was that when I started it, I didn't really know how to learn. I was a smart guy. I made it through school very, very easily. I didn't have to study very much. And with Jiu-Jitsu, whenever you start, 
even if you're a great shape, a marathon runner, a power lifter, you're going to go in there your first day. And some person that weighs 100 pounds less than you is going to just demolish you. They're going to strangle you 99 times. There's nothing you can do about it. So with that, it really teaches you some humility and some humbleness. And also you realize there's nothing you can't try any harder to do any better. You just sort of take your losses. You learn some new lessons. You lose a little bit less. And then you repeat that over and over again. And you feel that growth over time which is really how life works. It really accentuates how that process should work. The chances of sitting in your armchair and thinking of the perfect way to stop all of the things or to do everything never works out. It's really an iterative process. And so it really taught me that iterative process of learning, of failure being okay. And it's only failure if you don't learn and slightly improve over time. And I started that about 10 years ago and it's really been a life changer, yeah. It's changed how I view everything. It's really informed how I do my consulting practice as well with clients is that we're not looking for the exact right answer, just one in the general direction of right. And then we can adapt it and tweak it over time and improve it. Man, I keep hearing stories of jujitsu. I can't get down with the wrestling though. <laughs> yeah. So, so the jujitsu part is nice because it really benefits the nerds. So wrestling is more of just physically grinding as hard as you can against someone else to try to grind them down. Jiu-jitsu is more about like nerds win. If you can think through, it's like uh, chess with your body. You can think through like, if I have this grip and this grip, they can't do this thing. You can advance just by being smarter and having a better awareness of how the pieces fit together. That is fascinating, man. Let's think back over the last five years, what new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved your life? Yeah, for me, definitely it was focusing on time management. I've always been a super hard worker, never had any problems working 70, 80, 90 hour weeks and just getting things done. But when I really doubled down on focusing on time management, the basics like planning tomorrow, today, mapping out a project so that I am in advance knowing, hey, in two or three weeks, I have this event coming up. What are the preparatory steps to get ready for that? Looking at each day and making sure I have my top priority items in the order they should be done. That basically made it like I had two Lucases. It was like having an assistant because I was twice as productive. Oftentimes before I was working really hard and staying really busy. But whenever I started really prioritizing what was important, I found I was busy doing the most important things. And that changed everything. And with my clients, whenever they just add a few time management skills to the repertoire, they can really double or triple their operational capacity very quickly. What about these guys that are out there and I've seen it before? They're always putting out fires. What do you say to these people that are eternally putting out fires? Yeah, I think that that's part of the initial part of the journey is that you have to be running around putting out fires. But the goal is, is that you have to just have a little bit of proactive approach. You have to be reactive and put out fires. And then when you have a second to catch your breath, you have to say, well, what's the next fire that's going to pop up? Or how can I make sure this fire I just put out isn't a trick candle that just pops up again tomorrow? I'm putting it out in a more permanent way. Then you finally get an itty bitty foothold. And now you have to really capitalize on that 10 minutes that you got back to focus on future fires. And eventually you can have a proactive approach where you're sort of burn proof. And now you're more the Maytag repairman sitting around not having to worry about things as much. But to me, that's an early part of the journey that everyone really has to face is that reactive putting out fires piece. And the goal is to get rise above that and to set up systems so that you don't have to fight those same fires again and again. What are some bad recommendations you hear in your area of expertise? So I might get a lot of flack for this, but probably the uh, thing that probably drives me the craziest is people looking for marketing as the magic wand to fix all of their problems. So oftentimes I talk to people who have a pretty decent product and they don't really know what to do next. So they hear the magic wand of marketing will fix it. They pay some marketing firm thousands of dollars a month. They have absolutely no results from that. And then they have to go out of business because they spent their money on marketing. So marketing has its time and its place. To me, though, it's whenever you have a product that's irresistible, that people truly desire, and that will sell itself more or less with repeat and referral business, then marketing turns up the volume knob on that. But if you don't know how to sell your own product, to hire someone else to try to do it, it's probably a low level success piece and oftentimes an expense. And it's more of throwing your hands up and saying, I don't really know. I'll just trust someone else to do this for me. And a lot of marketing firms, in my experience, don't retain clients long term. They have a client for three months, six months that pays them a lot of money. They're not seeing the results. They fire that marketing firm. But the, it never really catches up with the firm's reputation that, hey, we're churning and burning people and we're not having sustained ongoing results where we're generating 
3x ROI month after month for people. So to look at marketing as a magic wand solution is one of my biggest things that I see happen that really takes advantage of entrepreneurs who don't really know where to turn. So they hey, say, hey, this person says they're an expert. I'll have to trust them. Where marketing is so good at marketing, marketing. It's so good at saying, hey, if you give me $10, I'll give you 30. That's a, an easy to fall for proposition for clients, unfortunately. How do you get into sales opportunities without marketing? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So to me, I think the difference is small scale marketing. So there's two types of marketing. There's brand awareness marketing where you're saying, hey, I'm over here, come find me. And there's lead generation marketing. So lead generation marketing is focused on when you're talking to someone actually having a sale. And oftentimes uh, when people are hiring marketing firms and looking at outside marketing, they're more of just yelling from the rooftop, I exist, come find me, the field of dreams approach. For a smaller business, the best thing to do is to go to like networking events face to face, join groups socially, have those one on one interactions. That's where you get the feedback and you see when I say this, do their eyes light up or not? When I say this, does the conversation die down or not? That really small scale pieces. Then if you do hire a marketing firm later, you have the information to say, these are the buzzwords that my clients really care about. This is what really activates my base. And this isn't. So you still do some level of that, but it's not uh, this sort of spray and pray method that's really cost and efficient. And when you have limited dollars and resources, you can't afford to do that. We interrupt your regularly scheduled program for a public service announcement. We're going to get right back into this show, but I wanted to ask you a question. If you have been listening to the show for any amount of time and you've picked up even one single tip, then I need your help. Get the word out. Tell people about resultsleader.fm. Share it on social media. Share it on your email. Share it anywhere. Hashtag resultsleader.fm. Now let's jump back into the interview. Lucas, why do results matter? Results matter because they keep you in the game. I mean, the goal of a business is to make money. You might have other goals like helping people, but if you're not making money, eventually you shut the business down. So if you're not getting those results where the effort you're putting in is yielding a higher return, you are just going to be out of business and have to stop. And I'd say the number one reason a business fails in my experience is that the owner gets tired. If the owner has energy, they can adapt, they can change, they can pivot, they can adjust services. Once they're too tired to solve problems, it's over. So if you're not having oversized results, you're going to be using every inch of energy you have and eventually get burnt out and unable to, to move forward. So you have to have leveraged results where you're getting an asymmetrical return on your effort in versus your results out, or you're just going to have to stop doing what you're doing. How do you get that leverage? What are things that we need in place to get leverage like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So it kind of varies. The biggest thing is creating something that gives a surplus of value to the end consumer. So basically, they're going to pay you a certain dollar amount to get a certain product. If they get an even exchange, they're pretty happy. They might use you again. The more surplus value they get, though, the more likely they are to tell their friends, family, neighbors. And so what happens is if you have a, a product with surplus value included, then you get a, a flywheel effect where more referrals and repeat business come into your ecosystem without you having to do the work yourself. You know, early on, you have to do all that marketing, that sales outreach. But as you get a stronger and stronger product loop, it kind of loops back on itself and you really get a lot of momentum going. So that's number one. Two is systems to make operations run smoother so you can deliver the same result using less capacity. You know, early on, you're probably doing everything just customized one to one. But after you've helped 37 people in a similar niche, you kind of have a system and a process kind of like your podcast. You've done this enough times, interviewed enough people. You have a system so that you can just kind of juggle this in the back of your brain without everyone taking every ounce of your energy. Does this work with only products or does it also work with services? Is it possible? I think actually with services, it's a bigger opportunity. The problem with products is that they tend to be less flexible. You can't make adjustments on the fly. With a service, you can, across one customer to the next, make an adjustment of, what if I deliver it this way? What if I deliver it that way? What if I pitch it this way? What if it's this scope? In the last five years, what new realization has helped you get better results for your client? Yeah, the biggest realization is that I can't do it for them. I can be a trusted advisor. I can be a secret weapon. I can offer them some guidance and help, but they have to be the one in the end that wants that result. And so for me, I can help them teach them the knowledge, help them work on the skill. Sometimes it just takes time, 
but they have to be the one driving forward. If it's me driving, it's just not going to work. Their pain has to be severe enough that they really want to do the thing that they need to do. What area of your business would you like better results? So this is a weird one for me. It's that whenever my clients are very successful, they have the business that they want, that they've grown and scaled to the level that they want. It's how to help them find out what to do in life. Whenever you're successful, it's really hard to figure out if I have infinite opportunities and choices, what do I even want to do? Whenever you're trying to struggle and grind and make your way forward, the pain is really evident. It guides you down the path. You know, sort of, I need to not go that way. I have to avoid that. But when you get to the pinnacle and you look around and say, well, now I've got the money I wanted. I'm putting in the time I want at work. Like this has been my identity for the past five or 10 years to grow this business. Who am I? What do I like? What hobbies do I have? I haven't had time for a hobby. What do I even want to do now? I have the money. I have the time. How do I find these new passions? That's the hardest part is whenever they're successful is what next? How do you figure that out? Uh, That's a really hard iterative process. And typically it involves things like I talked about that book, The Artist's Way earlier, them just trying different activities. I typically warn my clients when they're headed on the way to success is that they're going to be successful soon to a spot where they have time and they better start finding a hobby now. It's very similar to people in the workforce when they retire. I think that most of them, I think 80% die within five years of retiring. They lost their work identity. They don't have another thing that they do. They sit around and watch TV for a few months and then they're bored and they don't know what to do with their life anymore. You know, after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, he came back and you're depressed. You hit your goal. What now? You had that driving passion, that ambition. So now you look around and what next? So I, I really encourage them to start experimenting with different things, trying different hobbies, Entrepreneurs tend to need something that's infinite, meaning that painting, you know, a skill like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, something that will keep driving them chess, something that has a long, long learning potential where they don't just, okay, I can do this and now I'm done. I have to find a new hobby. They need something that's going to be a long bone to gnaw on to keep them active for a very long time. What results are you most proud of? I'm most proud of the clients that I've worked with that have ended up making a business they actually wanted to have. A lot of times whenever a a business is starting up, there's some momentum that can pull you in directions that aren't the best for you, ends up being a jail. You build a prison for yourself. You've built a job that you hate. You're working 90 hours a week. You're on call 24 seven. You have employees that aren't uh, doing things right and you hate going into work. The flip of that is that you can have a business set up how you want it. And oftentimes the sacrifice is, I'm gonna work a little bit harder on these days. I'm gonna make a little bit less money. There are sacrifices you make, but then you build it exactly how you want it. So it's sustainable and you're happy. And through that, I've helped save marriages. I've helped prevent people from having heart attacks and, and really major critical health issues. Any parting thoughts you wanna share with the results leaders who are listening right now? Yeah, my, my biggest thoughts are keep looking at people as individuals and humans. I think oftentimes we forget and assume that they're robots. A lot of the business books seem to indicate you can just be a robot and do all of the things, but we all have human psychology, human desires. And by focusing on the human element, we can find out what matches up best with the operations and systems for success. I know the results leaders who are listening are going to want more from you. Where can they get it? Yeah, the best place to find me is on my website, consultwithlucas.com. My social media is there. I have blog entries and a mailing list they can subscribe to. Excellent. We will have links to all of that in the show notes. Thank you for hanging out with us, Lucas. And thank you, results leaders, for tuning in. Another show is in the can. That is a wrap for another edition of resultsleader.fm. If you are out there getting results for your clients and you want to be featured on the show, go to resultsleader.fm now and apply to be on the show and if you love what you're hearing share the show give us a rating and review do anything to help us get the message out there thought leadership is easy but results leadership is hard we'll catch you on the next one this is the podcastfactory.com